Hej. Hej. Yeah, Keith, you definitely added way too much pressure. Wait a couple minutes at least, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, so I guess we can get started.
Uh, so hey guys, uh, we're going to be talking about DFS trees today, uh, which is a really nice topic that has a lot of uses for a lot of different types of graph problems. Um, to the point where, like, if you see like a general undirected graph problem, um, it's usually useful to think about DFS trees as like one of the first approaches for that because it usually simplifies it a lot. So basically, the idea behind the DFS tree is we're going to sort of reduce general graph problems to tree problems, um, which simplifies the structure a lot and makes the implementation usually pretty nice. Uh, so we're only going to be talking about undirected graphs here because um, a lot of the nice properties you get with undirected graphs don't show up with directed. Um, so yeah, we can just get into it. So basically, um, the DFS tree is uh, you're given some uh, general connected graph. And we're going to basically uh, form a spanning tree of the graph by doing a DFS. And every time you visit a vertex for the first time, um, that edge becomes part of your tree. Um, and then every time that you visit a vertex you've already seen, um, we call that edge a back edge. So basically, as you can see in this traversal here, um, as we're visiting the vertex for the first time, we're adding in these uh, darker tree edges. And then when the whole thing is formed, it only shows up for like a second. But you can see we form this rooted tree at one um, where the back edges are all sort of connected to send into an ancestor. Okay. Um, so basically the way we're determining uh, tree edges versus back edges is just, have we seen this vertex yet? Basically in our DFS. All right, and the one really nice um, thing we get out of this is that back edges always connect an ancestor with a descendant, okay? So like, let's say this was your DFS tree where um, these red edges are your back edges. Uh, so as you can see, all of these connect uh, an ancestor with a descendant. Like we don't have any like sort of crossing between subtrees. They always go like directly up to some ancestor. Um, and the reason for this is uh, because of like how the DFS ordering works, right? Because let's say this wasn't the case and we had some edge like AB um, that didn't connect an ancestor to a descendant, right? Because this is not in the same subtree. Um, well then in this case, um, A is explored before B, right? Because we have the edge going from A to B, um, which means that um, when we explored A the first time, right, we would have sort of DFS down from A and gotten everything we could reach from there, right? So um, before we backtrack up to A's parent here, we would have gone down from A, DFS everything we could possibly DFS from A, and then we would go back up. So uh, if we do it like that, then uh, B would end up in the subtree of A which is a contradiction because here it's not in the subtree of A. So we can't have any edges like this that sort of cross across uh, subtrees. It has to be from a descendant to an ancestor. And, oh, and one other quick thing. So I'm drawing them as directed here, um, but the back edges are still undirected. It's just uh, generally useful to think about them as sort of directed from the lower vertex to the higher vertex, but they are still completely undirected. Okay. Yeah, so this property here is um, really what gives us all the uh, nice properties of DFS trees. So this is very important. And so in terms of implementation, um, basically the way I usually like to do it is um, you take the graph and you sort of split it up into a bunch of different graphs. So if you have like your uh, initial adjacency list here in graph, um, we can sort of split the edges up into like almost four different types of edges. So one is the tree edges, um, which is specifically like directed down. So like tree U holds only the children of U in the DFS tree. And then we have parents stored separately out here. Um, this way we don't have to do the usual tree DFS thing where you like don't go back up to the parent. Uh, this way, because you don't have the parent stored in the adjacency list. So that makes it a little bit nicer. And then we also store back in and back out for every vertex, where back in is, again, we think of them as directed. 
So back in is a list of all the back edges coming into this vertex. So like this vertex would have two edges going into it. Um, this one would have one going into it. And then uh, same idea for back out. So this vertex has two going out of it. And the reason we split them up like this is in most problems, you have to treat um, these two differently somehow. Or in, in many problems, you'll sort of only have to deal with one. Um, but yeah, so this is uh, usually like overkill in terms of how much you actually need to like split it up. Um, but once you have it templated, um, it's a very short like function to write. So it's usually just easy to sort of use all of these pieces and sort of have that overkill um, rather than like trim it down. Okay. And so then for constructing all of this, um, so we construct a graph uh, like we normally do, where you, like you read in the edges and add them in both directions. And then we can do one DFS to fill everything else. Oh, and uh, the one array I didn't talk about here was depth, which is the depth of the vertex in the tree. So the root will be depth one, this will be depth two, depth three. Um, it's, it's the normal uh, idea of like depth in a tree. Okay, and we're also going to use depth um, as basically our used array. So depth equals zero is gonna represent a vertex that we haven't visited yet. And then depth equals one, two, three, four, whatever represents a vertex at that depth, which is why we start the root at depth one. Um, so yeah, so when we're DFSing from vertex i with parent p, um, we set the parent i equal to p and the depth of i equal to depth of parent plus one. Um, sort of quick detail, when we DFS from the root, we do DFS root root, which sets DF depth of the root equal to depth of root plus one, which sets it equal to one, which is sort of a nice trick, but that doesn't really matter much. So yeah, anyway, then we're going to iterate through everything that it's adjacent to in the graph that does not equal its parent, um, right? Because we don't want to add its parent to any of these three lists. And then if J is unvisited, if we have an unvisited neighbor of I, we're going to add that as a child of I, which means we add it into tree I, um, and then we DFS down from J. Uh, otherwise, we have already visited this. Um, and so now we want to see uh, is this a vertex that's above i? Like, is it an ancestor of i or a descendant of i? Um, and what we want to do is we only want to sort of catch each back edge once. So what we do is if it's an ancestor of i, then we add the back edge in both directions here. And if it's a descendant of i, we can ignore it because when we DFS from j, we're going to catch it, right? Because you, you only need to sort of catch it in one direction. So now once we have this back edge, um, we can add back in, we can add i to back in of j, right? Because we have an edge going from i into j, and we have an edge going out of i to j. So we add j to back out i. All right. Um, so before we get into problems, any questions on uh, like how this works or the implementation or any of this? Joe, can you go back to the code? Yeah. Um, I may have missed it. What does J minus P do? If J oh, right. So that's just checking J does not equal P, right? Because that's okay. uh, checking J minus P does not equal zero. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's just making sure we don't add the parent into any of these three lists. Okay. And so in all the problems we're going to do, we're going to assume that we have all of this filled, that we've already like called this. Is there um, a reason why you do it like you process all of them at both of them at the same time? When it, could, could you also do like depth i less than j, then you back in versus is greater than you to back out? Would that also work? You could. Yeah, that, that would work. It, it saves a couple characters, I think, but okay. there's no like deep reason for it. OK. All right, so now we can get into um, sort of the bulk of this presentation, which is the problems. Okay, so the first problem we're going to do is listing the bridges. Um, so in a lot of these problems, we're going to assume that the graph is connected. Um, but most of the time, the problem is equivalent if the graph is not connected. You just have to basically do a separate DFS tree for every component. But just to simplify it, we're going to assume it's connected for now. Um, so given a connected graph, we want to print a list of all of its bridges. 
Um, and a bridge is an edge where if you remove it, uh, the number of connected components increases by one. So like this edge would be a bridge, because if you remove this edge, uh, we sort of cut off this triangle here. Um, so yeah, uh, do you guys have any ideas how we could do this with DFS tree? Even like uh, conceptual ideas, not even necessarily code. So one thing with a lot of these problems is um, they're sort of built on like a lot of observations that sort of build on each other. So if you guys have anything, uh, like even some small observation, feel free to speak up because uh, those really add up for these problems. Um, is, it, is it like an edge, uh, a bridge if like, so if one of the tree edges is a, br is a bridge, then uh, the parent, doesn't have any uh, out, is it out or in, I forget, uh, in, in nodes in that subtree of the, of the child? Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's basically it, uh, except not necessarily the parent. So um, an edge is a bridge if there isn't a back edge that sort of passes over it. Um, so like for this edge here, um, this, back edge here passes over it. And same with these two, right? So um, because we have this edge passing over it and we have this path down from here, right? Because we know that uh, this back edge is connecting an ancestor and a descendant. So we have this path here plus this back edge gives us a cycle. So that this can't be a bridge now, right? Um, so we want to sort of um, figure out how to tell if every edge has a back edge going over it. Okay, I guess we can go to the next slide because that has a couple other observations. So another observation is um, a back edge can't be a bridge because if you remove a back edge, um, everything is still connected with the tree edges, right? Because the tree edges form a spanning tree. So none of the back edges are gonna be bridges. So we only have to worry about the tree edges. And now we sort of want to figure out uh, what a nice way of, like, I guess, implementing um, like whether an edge has a back edge passing over it. Um, so do you guys have any ideas about that? So again, it can go to the parent or it can go to any ancestor past the parent. And that will- What do you mean by uh, passing? What did you say passing through it? Passing over it or something like that? What do you mean? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so by passing over it, I mean um, basically a back edge from a descendant to an ancestor of that edge. So like for this edge, for example, um, like this edge, we can think of it as passing over because it goes from a descendant of this vertex uh, to an ancestor of this vertex, which is just itself. Um, so yeah, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. And this is one where thinking about it as a tree problem really helps. Is there like a time constraint here? Uh, yeah, we want to do it in like linear in terms of n plus m. So like, okay. yeah, like constant number of DFSs or something. And we can actually do this in one DFS is another hint. Wait, can you like go down in the tree or something and then store which back edges you're using or something like that? Yeah, that sounds like it's on the right track. Um, yeah. So like the question is how do you like sort of store that and like update it at every node? 
like I guess whenever you see that you have some like out back edges, you actually yeah, I'm not sure. No, you're very close. I think. Um. Maybe you add a like a direction, like the back edge is goes through like his third child or something, and then you just like keep going down the tree and you you have like all the back edges that are currently active for the the current child you have, and then you just keep like marking those as not used if there's a, at least one back edge in your list or something like that. Yeah. So you're very close. Um, so that's basically what we want to do is we want to sort of do a DFS and like maintain which back edges are currently passing over the current edge. Where like when we're DFSing from a vertex, we, we want to know like which back edges are passing over the edge from it to its parent, essentially. Um, and we can maintain that set um, by uh, like looking at back in and back out and all that kind of stuff. Um, the problem with that, uh, actually, that might work. Um, yeah, if you did it as a set, I think that would work. Like if you stored um, a set of the current back edges and sort of updated that as you go, that would work. Because then you can um, remove an insert in log time um, and that should be okay. But uh, we can actually do it simpler uh, because notice that we don't need to know like exactly which back edges are passing it passing over. The only thing we need to know is the number of back edges passing over. So basically, the idea we can do is sort of do what we were doing before with a set of back edges, um, except only maintain how many of them there are. So which sort of uh, I like to think of it as like a prefix sum type idea, um, where like you're going up from the leaf to the root. Uh, it's kind of like a tree DP also. Um, so what we can do is for every vertex, if we store delta i, which is like number of back edges out minus number of back edges in, um, we can compute the number of back edges passing over i recursively using uh, the answers for its children. Um, and I have an example here we're gonna go over soon, but the formula is you add up the number of back edges going over the children, and then you add in your delta. So basically, the way this works is, so this would be our delta array, um, which is, again, number of back edges out minus number going in. So for example, this one has one going out and none going in. So this has a value of one. Um, this one has none going out and two going in. So this is negative two. And I don't think any of these vertices have it, but we could have one that has some going out and some going in. So we like subtract one from the other. Um, so yeah, that's how we get this delta array. And then what we want to do is we want to compute this back array, which tells us how many um, edges are passing over, uh, how many back edges are passing over the edge from i to its parent um, for each i. And then once we have this, um, bridges are just going to be the zeros in this graph except for the root. Um, so we get these three um, zeros here, and those are exactly the three bridges in the graph. And so the way we compute this is, um, like let's say we're looking at computing this. So we look at how many back edges are passing over each of these children, and we add them up, right? Because each of these back edges um, sort of can extend past that node and go further up, um, except we want to then delete all the ones that stop at this node, and then add in all the ones that start at this node, which is the same as adding delta i, right? Because that's exactly what delta i holds. So if you add up 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus delta i, which is negative 1 here, then you get 3. And so you'll notice if you do that for uh, any of these nodes in the tree, um, that that works out. Um, so yeah, then we can basically just do this one DFS um, and that gives us all these values, and then we have our bridges. So 
So questions on this? Wait, sorry, how does it exactly give you your bridges? All right, so we're, we're basically doing what we were talking about before with like maintaining the set of back edges, except all we're doing is uh, maintaining how big the set is. Um, and we're doing that by sort of adding up the values for all the children. Oh, and well, then... Uh, um, so sort of more analogous right. to the set thing, can you not also implement it as when you were going to do the set insert, just do plus one? And if you do the set uh, erase, just do a minus one in some global value. Would that not do the same thing? Instead of... So every time, yeah. if, if you remember the if else in your original DFS, right? If uh, depth i is less than j, you do plus one. If it's greater than uh, j, you just do minus one. And if it's zero, then it's yeah. a bridge. Yeah, that would also work. I think the set thing might not work if you have like a lot of children, because then you have to merge a lot of sets and that might take too long. Uh, you might be able to do some small to large merging or something and save that. Um, no, but but this is definitely easier to work with. No, but can, can you implement that set globally? And it's the same thing here with the cow and you can implement that globally. Maybe. Um, I, I think you'd have to add like a little bit of okay. code or something. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it would work, but I think this way is definitely cleaner. So then, the, so then the edges that work are the ones that connect to, uh, that, uh, that have at least one zero, or sorry, both, yeah, to have at least, wait. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, an edge is a bridge if um, the lower vertex of that edge is a zero. So this is storing how many vertices, how many back edges are passing over the edge from this to its parent. So you can sort of think of this label as being applied to the edge above it. And then all the edges with zeros on them are bridges, which is why we exclude the root, because there is no edge above that to be a bridge. All right, uh, you guys good? OK, so code for this, um, once we have the other DFS done, is pretty straightforward. Um, this is the delta value we were talking about before. Um, and then we, again, add in all the um, back values for the children. And then um, if back is 0, um, then we can add in the edge from i to its parent as a bridge. And then we return the back value. OK. Is, uh, is the root 1 in this case? Oh, yes. The root is 1 in this case. Yeah. Okay. All right. So next problem. Uh, we have a connected undirected graph. And we want to uh, direct its edges such that we can reach every vertex from every other. So we want to make it strongly connected um, or say that it, this is impossible. So I guess the first question is, uh, when would this be impossible? When it's uh, when it's not connected, when it's undirected? Yeah, so that would be one case. Okay. Um, and so one hint is the last problem. Oh, it, it's impossible if there's one edge that is in, is a bridge. Right, exactly. Um, so we can't do it with bridges. Um, and it turns out that's the only case where we can't do it. Um, so can you guys think of how we could direct the edges to make it work uh, if we don't have bridges? Right, yeah, okay, so we can go to the next slide. I forgot what the next slide. Yeah, so if there's bridges, it's impossible because uh, whichever way you direct the bridge, you can't reach one component from the other. So now, given that we don't have bridges, um, how could we solve it? 
And this one is a really clean solution. Isn't it just, you basically just draw the DFS tree kind of out. It looks yeah. like it goes down to the children. That's like directed that direction. And then if it's a back edge, it goes up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we can direct all the tree edges down and all the back edges up. And uh, assuming we have no bridges, then this works because um, from every non-root node, we know that there is some back edge that passes over um, this node, right? So we can go down to that back edge and go back up and now we've gotten higher. So we can keep iterating this until you get up to the root. And then you can use the tree edges to get down to any vertex you want. So uh, if we direct them this way, we can get from every vertex to every other vertex. So we've satisfied the condition. And then the implementation for this is very straightforward. Um, once you check for bridges, um, you can basically just print out the DFS tree essentially. So questions on this? Okay. All right, so on this problem, um, again, connected uh, undirected graph, and we want to split it into as many edge disjoint paths of length two as possible and list all of these paths. So like in this example, you have like the orange path, the green path, the red path, and the blue path. Um, so this one out of um, all the problems we're gonna do is probably the most like a tree problem. Um, so thinking about it as a tree is very helpful. Are all these problems time complexity just like n plus m? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah, because usually if you like do the initial DFS tree, DFS plus like one other DFS, that's usually all it takes. Um, and you can combine the two for most of these probably, but it's it's just easier to do them separately. Wait, Joe, what does it mean by edge disjoint? But yeah, so uh, you can't have the same edge be in two paths, basically. OK, gotcha. Yeah. I guess one thing to think about is uh, if the graph were a tree, how could you solve it? And then the solution adding back edges is similar. Maybe, I mean, for I'm not sure even for a tree, but for a tree, would it be like you start at the greatest depth node and then like you keep going up, but you prefer the same level to have two paths joining each other? Yeah. Um, so you can 
kind of do like a greedy thing starting at like the bottom of the tree and working your way up. Right? Um, and yeah. So, so the idea is like, so, so how would you deal with like moving from a vertex to its parent? That's like the one trick. What do you mean? So like, uh, if you're, let's say you've already like sort of processed all the vertices in your subtree. Um, how would you, if you're like doing this idea where like you start from the bottom and work your way up, um, how do you, I guess, how do you process a node given that you've processed all of its children? Okay, uh, I think I might just show you guys this one because this one's sort of a hard trick to see without having seen it before. Um, but yeah, Andrew is right. You want to sort of start from the bottom and kind of do like a greedy approach. Um, and the idea behind that is, um, oh, wait one second. Yeah, there we go. Um, so for every vertex, we want to make as many pairs as possible using the edges that are touching V that we haven't used um, in the subtree of V. Um, and then uh, if we sort of have to use the edge to the parent to pair off the last vertex, then we do that. Otherwise, we leave that edge for the parent to process. Um, so we can sort of think of like, either you pass up the edge to the parent or you don't, depending on whether or not you used it. Um, and because we just need paths of length too. Um, the freedom to use the parent edge or not use the parent edge uh, sort of lets us um, maximally use everything else, right? Because like, let's say you have an even number of unused edges, then you just don't use the parent edge and you pass that up. And if you have an odd number, um, you pair up the parent edge with one of those then you pair everything else up. So probably the best way to see this is with an example. So if we have this tree, we're going to go through in DFS order and process all these vertices. So the first one, we go down here. Um, there's two edges here. Uh, one of them is the parent. Right. So the idea is we're going to pair up all the edges next to this vertex that we haven't done yet, but only pair up the parent if we have to. So in this case, we have to because we have an even number of edges here. So we form one pair. OK. Um, then the next one we're going to go to in the DFS order is down here because we want to process all the children before the parent. We're doing basically like a post order traversal here. Um, yeah, so this is the next one. We're in the same situation as we were before. Um, we have two edges, so we can pair these two up and then we're done. And then we go up here. Uh, here we have one edge, right? So we can't pair this up with anything but it's the parent edge, so we don't really care, right? So we pair up everything we can, uh, which is nothing, and then we pass the parent edge up. So now we go down to this vertex, we get uh, a similar situation uh, with these two. Oh, wait, I think there's supposed to be a back edge here. Oh, right, so we process this, we do nothing. Then we process this one. Yeah, there's supposed to be a back edge here. We process this one, um, and we add in these two back edges, 
And notice that we have a leftover because we have an odd number. And we make sure that that's the edge to the parent, right? Because now we're going to go to this parent and we can sort of deal with all the edges that we passed up from the children, right? So here we have three edges. And okay, again, we can't pair them all up. So again, we're going to just ignore the edge to the parent for now and just pair this one up. Then we go down here. Uh, we have two edges, we can pair that. Here we have one, we can't make any pairs. Here we can uh, grab this edge that we passed up plus the edge to the parent. That forms a pair. Um, and then here, uh, at this node, we can't pass anything up because there's only one. Here we can fix both of these children at once. Um, and then again here we have two edges, so we take them. Here we have one, we can't make a pair. Um, and then here we can sort of grab this edge from the child and the edge to the parent. And the one time you can get stuck is when you're at the root. Because once you're at the root, you don't have an edge to a parent that you can grab. Um, so like in this case, you can get stuck here in a case where you have a leftover edge. But it turns out this is still optimal, right? Because um, we physically can't add any more pairs because there's only one left, right? Because we would need an extra edge in order to like be able to fit another pair of edges in here, right?